So these are the objectives, some of the things that we're going to cover, some of the differences in instability patterns between the skeletally immature or pediatric patient and the more skeletally mature patient. Um, we are going to discuss some of the on-field and acute management, including kind of relocation techniques for a dislocated shoulder. Uh, and then we'll discuss some of the evidence-based recommendations for treatment. Once we have the shoulder relocated, um, how, do we, how do we address that and how does it differ between the patients that we're dealing with? So we know from an abundance of, of literature, including kind of Don Comstock's uh, Rio data, that adolescent shoulder instability is much higher in the athletic population than it is in the general population. So it's a very much an athletic problem. Uh, I thought this was an interesting um, uh, uh, graph because it showed that the, the, actually the rate of shoulder instability is higher in high school athletics than it is actually in college, which is... Uh, counter uh, to all the other sports, which is actually much higher in the college level, probably related to speed, strength, and every, uh, the higher level of participation. Um, this was a, a retrospective uh, review uh, out of Canada, which they, so they've got a captive audience as far as, uh, so our retrospective review and their databases are very strong, uh, which really just demonstrates the takeaway here is actually the uh, increasing rate of shoulder instability episodes, both in the primary uh, setting uh, between the ages of 12 and 16, you can see a really rapid rise. And then also the, uh, the orange bars are those that required uh, repeat reductions. And so we see not only an increase in primary episodes, but also those that required repeat shoulder reduction. So we know this is a really common problem. Um, these are two patients that I think we, we will all know. They may look a little bit different and they may act a little bit different, but these are all patients that will show up in our clinics, in our training rooms, uh, in our office settings. Um, a, a younger patient, 12 to 13 year old male who plays multiple sports and is right hand dominant, who sustains a, a shoulder dislocation, not even playing any of his sports while he's skiing with his family. And then our 17 year old who's going to be our more mature patient, uh, who's a senior, plays football, and this is his primary sport in his senior year, sustains his first time uh, shoulder dislocation. So we know that we may have the kid that acts like a little bit of an old soul, and we have old souls that act a little bit like kids, but we know there's distinct differences between those two groups. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about those uh, differences because kids are not just little versions of adults. The proximal humerus, uh, which accounts for obviously 50% of what we're going to be talking about, not including the glenoid, uh, starts as three ossification centers, uh, including the humeral head and the greater and lesser tuberosities. Those will ossify around age five to seven. And those will fuse uh, to join the proximal humeral head. Um, and, you can still, and you can see now the proximal humeral physis, which will close uh, usually earlier in females between that 14 to 16, 17 age group, and then a little bit later in males uh, between 16 and 18 years of age. So this is, uh, we understand that their anatomy, okay, is different when they're skeletally immature, okay? They have an increase in capsular elasticity. Their collagen is just looser. We're going to talk about that um, kind of in, on the next slide, but we know that kids are just stretchy when they're young, and as we get older, we're not as stretchy. We're a little bit tight. They actually have a more laterally based capsular insertion on the glenoid, okay, different from where it is, okay, and that's related to just the development of the bones, um, but the actual laterally based capsular insertion actually makes the inferior kind of actually recess, the capsule actually makes it a little less voluminous. And so it can actually stretch out, but not be plastically deformed, okay, unlike it does when we get a little bit older. Um, so and we know that the capsule and labrum at this age group is much more tolerant and actually stronger than the physial strength. Okay, so we know that the physis in really all injuries is probably the weak link in the chain until it closes. So this is what I was talking about. There's a lot going on on this slide, but the, really the take-home message is that there's a transition in our collagen types as we go from adolescence through puberty and into adulthood with a change from type 3 collagen to type 1. I'm not sure if I did that or not, but yeah. So we get a change from that type 3 collagen, which is that really stretchy, elastic collagen, to the type 1, we know that, that these, the type 3 is less susceptible to plastic deformation, okay? 
and we know that that may contribute to, this is outside the scope of this talk, but maybe a little bit more in, in line with those multi-directional instability pictures. So again, still talking about the fact that these kids are not adults, we actually see different injury patterns in the younger patient than we do in the older patient, okay? We're less likely, so when we talk about typical injury patterns that are sustained as a result of an anterior shoulder dislocations. We're talking about tears to the labrum, the fibrocartilaginous ring that helps to deepen the socket on the glenoid. We talk about, that would be considered what we call a bank heart lesion, so that's a common term that we'll hear this morning. Uh, so we, we, we see bank heart lesions. We also see uh, what's called a hill sax lesion. So you can see here in this bottom image where the humeral head, when it when it goes out the front, so the front side of the front side of the shoulder is on the on the right side of this image, and the back side of the shoulder is on the left. You can imagine as the ball dislocates anteriorly, we see two zones of injury. We see injury to the labrum and the anterior aspect and the capsular attachments here, and then we also see a compensatory divot in the back of the head from the impact when the shoulder dislocates. Okay. Um, in younger kids, we don't tend to see those prototypical injury patterns like we see uh, maybe in older patients, okay? In our experience, in a, this is actually pretty recent data, in 131 patients, these are all less than 15 years of age, we see a, a significant increase in more atypical lesions. And what I mean by atypical, it's not the bank heart and it's not the hill sacs, okay? We see other things. We see avulsions of the glenohumeral ligaments. We see periosteal sleeve avulsions because their periosteum is much thicker, okay? And we see avulsions of that lesser tuberosity. So we see different things in these younger patients than we typically would see in a more mature shoulder. All right, so that's the background. That's the anatomy. That's what we're kind of looking at. That's what we're talking about this morning. Now we're going to talk about kind of the on-field or acute management. We've got a shoulder that's actually dislocated. Um, how do we manage it? What do we do with it? Uh, how do we get it back in? Okay. Who has experience relocating or reducing shoulders here? How many people? Okay, maybe, maybe half. Hopefully it's going to be more here in about 45 minutes. Um, so we, we, have our, we have our senior football linebacker in a game. He goes down. We get out there. <laughs> Who's going to reduce it? Who, whose job is it? Who's going to do it? We're going to talk about this because there's, there's some kind of, I don't want to say rules, but unspoken, like whose job is this, okay? Because it really depends on the setting, okay? Here, if somebody has a dislocated shoulder, to be honest, I'm probably not going to be the guy that's going to do it, okay? We're probably going to call Dr. Ellis. We're going to call Dr. Harbison, Dr. Miller, Dr. Jones. We're going to call probably the most qualified individual, okay? Okay. Um, but in that setting, okay, that may be the primary care physician that's covering a football game. That may be the athletic trainer that's at a practice, okay? So the decision to do that, okay, we want to we want to find that most qualified individual has the most experience, okay? So what we're going to start with is we're going to start with a pretty brief history. Now, shoulder dislocations, for those of you that have seen them, know this. For those of you that haven't, these patients are pretty good at telling you what happened. They're pretty good at telling you what the problem is. My shoulder is out. My shoulder dislocated. My shoulder is not in the socket, okay? They're usually pretty worked up about it, and it's usually pretty apparent, okay? Because our initial assessment really involves what we see, right? So for somebody that doesn't have shoulder pads on, that initial inspection may tell you a lot. We see some pretty characteristic findings from a shoulder that is dislocated anteriorly. So all of this is going to be related to anterior dislocations inferior dislocations and posterior dislocations, different story, but they have a very characteristic appearance. We have a flattening of the shoulder from a prominent acromion, the tip of the shoulder there, okay? And there's also, sometimes it's maybe not as visible, but it's very readily palpable as sulcus in the back of the shoulder. So when you, when you just even lightly touch the shoulder, the humeral head is not there anymore, so you can't feel it in the back because you can always feel it in the front. In these super skinny minis, okay, you can see it, okay? The really thin kid, the 13-year-old, the, you know, those people, you can actually see it sitting in the anterior aspect of the shoulder. The coracoid becomes hard to palpate because it's almost confluent with the humeral head, 
So we started our initial assessment. For those that have shoulder pads on, we may not have much from an inspection standpoint, so we're gonna probably go to palpation pretty quickly, okay? And I think the athletic trainers are well versed in this, that the first move for that, for the kid that says my shoulder's out, my hand's going straight up the front part of their shoulder, uh, just their shoulder pads to feel it, okay? Because it's, it's a pretty clinical diagnosis. We really don't even, there's actually literature to support this, from a good history, and somebody that says my shoulder's out, and us putting our hand on it, I think we could all agree that shoulder probably doesn't feel right and it probably has an anterior shoulder dislocation. As always, we want to know our neurovascular exam is, is very, very important, okay? We're not necessarily looking for a complete and full, like, dermatomal and myotomal assessment. We're looking for motor firing patterns, usually initially, okay? So I'm usually having them... Um, extend their thumb, checking sensation distally, checking a radial pulse, making sure they have thumb opposition, making sure they have finger extension and can cross their fingers that their radial nerve, their median nerve, and their ulnar nerve are all functioning. And then we have a good radial pulse distally, and so we can rest assured that we have a nice, normal neurovascular exam. Anybody here want to guess what the most common neuropraxia is? Or what's the most common nerve-related problem from an anterior shoulder dislocation? Not everybody at once. It's actually it's the axillary nerve, okay? So that's another thing that we're actually going to check, okay? We can check that pretty easily by just assessing the sensation on the lateral aspect of their arm, okay? Usually as a result of the stretch that's, that's produced with the injury or from the abnormal tension that's on, on the neurovascular bundle, they'll end up at this, and it's actually recorded as much as even half of the time, okay? Unlike radial, median, ulnar nerve neuropraxia, which may be probably more of a contraindication to reduction, axillary neuropraxia, not really, in my mind, a contraindication to putting their shoulder back in, okay? Um, so the sports-specific considerations, it's really more related to Shoulder pads, okay, and whether or whether or not you take these shoulder pads off, um, that you can actually, there's kind of techniques, and we'll talk about that, that you can actually reduce the shoulder even before you get their shoulder pads off. So what are our red flags? We talked about neurovascular injury, loss of pulse, radial nerve palsies, weakness of the extremity, okay? Humeral head or neck fractures, I think one of the easiest ways to kind of differentiate this is really looking for an inspection, or obvious ecchymosis. So if we're seeing ecchymosis that's, that's present in, the, in those first initial minutes after the injury, especially in a thin kid, that'd be, a, that'd be a contraindication to reduction. Also, with gentle internal and external rotation of the arm, even with their arm currently dislocated, the head and the shaft of the humerus, they should move together without crepitus. So if we're noting crepitus when we start to do this, and especially considering the age of the patient, much more likely in some of these patients that they could have a proximal humerus fracture that's just displaced rather than an actual shoulder dislocation. And so if their shoulder's not out, we probably shouldn't try to put it back in. Okay, so just considering uh, that the, there's, there's a possibility they can have concomitant injuries. Clavicle fracture is also another thing. We wanna make sure that we clear their clavicle and we clear their cervical spine um, because those things can happen uh, together. So we've cleared this kid. He doesn't have any of these red flags. We're going to package him up, and we're going to send him to the ER. Right? I ruined it because I went too fast. <laughs> we're not going to do that. We're just we're going to try to learn because we're going to try and keep him out of the emergency department, at least acutely, because actually what we'll figure out is that it may be actually easier, better for the patient, more cost-effective to do this early. Okay? We've got this kid there. We can relieve the stress on the neurovascular structures, the axillary nerve you know, stretch that happens, all of these things. We can get it back in because what we'll see is actually over time, and that starts at the time of dislocation moving forward, there's increasing amounts of muscle spasms that are occurring, which are only making it harder for us, even more the most experienced clinicians, and even in the emergency department, for somebody in emergency room position that does this all the time, it's getting harder and harder to get the shoulder in when it's been out for minutes and moving into hours. 
We want to minimize the defects or the, uh, the, the pressure on the humeral head and the glenoid. We know that those two surfaces are covered in cartilage, which are being point loaded and they're loaded in ways that they're not supposed to be loaded, which we know has long-term detrimental effects. Okay, so we want to get those two surfaces back opposed the way that they're supposed to be. And according to costhelper.com, we may save them $8,000. I just found that number. Okay, we know we save them some money. If we can save them a trip to the emergency room, we can save them a sedation or an injection, or God forbid, an open reduction, okay? We can save them a lot of money, okay? How much? Doesn't matter. We know we can do better if we can get this in quickly. So back to touch on who does it, okay? Um, there was actually, in 2008, there was a joint consensus statement uh, from the AOS and AOSSM that really lacked a thorough consensus on whose job is this, who needs to be reducing this, other than we need a qualified individual who's educated on the problem and who knows what they're doing, okay? And it just deferred to the state and to the individual practice acts to figure it out, okay? So it really lacked a lot of consensus. The NATA has an, a position statement on joint dislocations, many, many joints, glenohumeral joint being one of them, which again is fairly broad and vague that's, that recommends individual athletic trainers specifically work with their team physicians to develop a plan of action, okay, um, for, because they are well-qualified individuals to be able to reduce these things with good clinical history and a little education um, that they, they're very well-qualified. And then the Texas Department of, of Licensing and Regulation, which manages and, and regulates athletic trainers in the state of Texas, says the same thing. We should work with our team physicians um, to determine the appropriate uh, plan of care. So I'm going to have Katie. She's one of our therapists that's graciously agreed to let me um, not dislocate her shoulder, but to um, kind of talk to you about a few techniques. Um, because as I was getting this talk ready, um, when they said, hey, we want you to kind of educate people on how to put it back in. If you look at the literature, there's like 15 or 20 different individual techniques that have been written about even back, you know, in the 1800s and all have different names. So I'm going to have you, you can just come lay down, put your head right up here. And they all have different names. But when I, was, I started talking to people, I'm like, because when I reduce a shoulder, I, I don't actually do a technique. I just put it back in. And so... I didn't know if that was just me, and maybe I was mistreating people. And I started talking to some of the colleagues. I'm like, well, what technique do you use? And they all kind of look at you like, well, I don't know. I just, I just kind of put it back in. I don't use an individual technique, okay? And so I was like, well, gosh, how do I do that? So this is the kind of the purpose of this, that, to kind of give you a few tricks on how we actually do it, okay? So we're going to pretend like Katie's the football player on the ground, okay, on the field, and, and we're just kind of getting out to her, all right? And so we're going to provide that really quick, brief assessment. We're going to skip past the ABCs, okay? We know we're going to clear their cervical spine because they're usually pretty good at telling us, okay? And so we're on the field. We're going to pretend that this is a game, okay? So time's kind of of the essence. I don't like being watched. This is a big audience for me. You get in front of a whole stadium full of people. We want this shoulder back in. We want it in in a hurry, right? So I'm usually going to kind of Firm that I can feel that humeral head out there. She's telling me, he's telling me, they are telling us that their shoulder is dislocated and it needs to be back in. Okay? Once I've confirmed that, their clavicle's non tender, their cervical spine's non tender, I've assessed their neurovascular exam looking at all the function of their nerves in their hands. And then we decide, boy, I really kind of would love for this shoulder to be back in pretty quickly. And so we're trying to calm them down. Usually my first Step is just to pull inline traction just directly down the shoulder, okay, directly down the arm, okay? This is usually not a heroic maneuver. We're not trying to pull their arm off. It does have to be a firm grasp of the distal humerus and pull because it's usually held in some degree, okay, of AB or adduction and some degree of rotation. They're all a little bit different. Some are more externally rotated and some are actually more internally rotated, but effectively, we're going to try to give a little bit of inline traction. And what I'll actually do is actually somewhat flex it, bring it out to the side, and we're gently internally and externally rotating as we forward elevate. I'm usually going to give that one try, okay? I'm going to try right there, and it's going to go, and she's going to say, oh, 
or it's not. If it doesn't go, I don't keep trying. I don't want all these people in the stands, including mom and dad and grandma and everybody else, worrying about it. So we're probably going to get off to a little bit better spot. We've tried them once. Now we need to get them off. So we're going to pretend that we were just on the ground. Okay? So we're going to sit her up. I'm still pulling inline traction. Okay? And I'm actually going to pull inline traction all the way to where we're headed. Okay? Depending on the setting, this may be to the, may be to the table on the sideline. It may be inside. Okay? But I'm pulling inline traction okay, while they are standing up. Okay, because what you'll find is that sometimes, even before you even get to the sideline, the shoulder will reduce even with gentle inline axial traction. Okay? All right. So we got her we got her over to the table, okay? And it's still not in. Okay? We've tried once. What else can we do? Okay? You can maybe try it again, especially if you're worried about the shoulder pads. But another technique, which does have a name, is called a Stimson maneuver. You don't have to know that, but it's a very good technique. Actually involves them laying on their stomach. Okay, so one thing you can do, I wouldn't necessarily do it out on the field, but in the office, in the emergency department, uh, in the training room, it's very reasonable to lay them on their belly. So you're going to have her lay on her stomach. We're going to switch shoulders. So now her other shoulder is dislocated. We're going to lay her way on the edge here. We're going to try and stabilize her shoulder blade. We're actually just going to weight her arm. A cuff weight, anything, you can pull on it. And you can. But really what we're looking for is just fatigue. Okay? So a weight on the wrist and time. Okay? This is a great technique that the athletic trainer, the person that's like, I mean, I tried, I couldn't get it back in, I'm really nervous, I don't want to try again. This is a great technique because it's very safe okay? and effective. It can go in like this, okay, that with time, that this may reduce the shoulder, okay, just in this position, okay? The athletic trainer that calls their team physician and says, I have a shoulder dislocation, this may be all, if you're not comfortable with it, this may be all you do. Maybe they're on their way, they're not there yet. Put them in this position, and maybe by the time they get there, you may be surprised to see the shoulder gets back in place. So there's just a couple of techniques, okay, that don't necessarily all have names, okay, but should at least provide you a good attempt. All right, thank you, Katie. Um, a good attempt at um, getting the shoulder back in. All right. Is my time up? Oh, okay. Um, all right, so we demonstrated that. So one thing I, I mentioned that I, I went and talked, uh, I talked to the people that I trust, okay, I talked to you know the people that are going to have to deal with this if we screw it up. Uh, I talked to I talked to our shoulder surgeons. I talked to our shoulder experts. So uh, I asked Dr. Wilson, I said, "How do you how do you put your shoulder back in?" I said, "Do you use a Hippocratic technique? Do you, if, I'm not sure what that is, but you know some kind of combination of counter traction and traction. Uh, we usually get it back in, but don't underestimate the value of the Stimson maneuver. It's very safe. It's very effective. Okay." especially for people that are, are new or just learning or aren't, you know, super comfortable, um, it's, it's a really valuable technique. Dr. Ellis, uh, obviously, who, who I trust tremendously, he has personal experience with this. He, he's got a had, hopefully, and will never come out again. He had a problem with chronic shoulder instability. Um, he said, you know, inline traction is your best friend. He had a unique perspective. Um, because I actually mentioned to him, sometimes I'll straighten their elbow out and walk them off the field. You know, we do inline traction. I'll do it with their elbow straight. He said, don't do that. He said, it really hurts. When you, when you straighten their elbow out, he goes, I'm, I can tell you from personal experience, it really hurts when you straighten my elbow out. So don't just, if you want to do it to them, that's fine, but don't do it to me. Um, so just a consideration, okay, that they may have some spasm of their biceps that it may actually really be uncomfortable to straighten their elbow out. And I talked to Dr. Arvison. Dr. Arvison's, boy, he's, he's, he's new to our practice, but he's got a lot of experience, and he, he's a shoulder guy, okay? He's a shoulder guy. Uh, and he, he really, he recommended, you know, having a good foundational knowledge of your anatomy, okay, especially knowing what you're doing when you're providing internal and external rotation, that that can, just the knowledge of how to move the pieces together, okay, can help set you up for success for reducing the shoulder. All right, so now we're back in. Okay, we got our shoulder in, we've reduced, 
both the 13-year-old, the 17-year-old, whoever, insert the, you know, fill in the blank. Now what do we do? What is our evidence-based recommendations? The parents are asking the athletic trainer, well, what do we do now? What, or they've just come back from the physician and they're not sure. Or they're in the primary care provider's office, the pediatrician's office, and they say, I had a shoulder dislocation. It's the first time. Do, do I need to go to a specialist? Does this need surgery? Okay. We're going to kind of give you a few recommendations based upon what we know from this. Okay. Hopefully now your understanding based upon the literature we presented early and what we've talked about is that these are not comparing apples to apples. These, while they carry the same ICD-10 code of a shoulder dislocation, they're different patients. They act different. They have different pathology and may be treated differently. Management of acute first-time shoulder instability has been written by, by countless people, none of which agree, okay, on the appropriate management, whether that be everybody gets non-op treatment or everybody gets surgical treatment, okay? So it, there's no well-agreed-upon um, first-time management. This is a pretty well-done systematic review by Longo who looked at um, our population, so they're looking at those kind of 18 years of age and younger, um, looking at recurrence rates. So that's probably the number one thing that we're worried about and should be the primary discussion point is the shoulder came out, it was the first time, now it's back in, what's the risk that it's going to happen again? That's really what everybody wants to know is, is it going to happen again? Because if it's not, my shoulder's in, they don't really care, okay? Um, but we know that in these patients, very high rate, 70% recurrence rate, okay, in this population. Um, in those that had surgery, okay, for their going to hormone instability, only about a 17% ish recurrence rate after that, okay? So maybe we should treat more of these with surgery than with PT. Not necessarily, okay? Um, so after we've got this in, okay, what do we do? Does this person, who thinks the shoulder dislocation that had no red flags, that went in with one try and has a normal neurovascular exam following the reduction, do they need to go to the emergency department? by a show of hands. Thank goodness. Okay. I don't know who raised their hand online, but if you did, it's, no, it's okay. They don't need to go to the emergency room, in our opinion, okay? If they have good pain control, they're adequately immobilized, um, and, and there were no complications from it, appropriate outpatient follow-up is, is fine. Um, but how should, we, how should we immobilize them? Should we wrap their arm and, and, and wrap it to their belly? Should we just put them in a simple sling? Should they be in position of internal or external rotation? How should they position their arm? How long do we keep them in the sling? Is it one week? Is it three weeks? Is it six weeks? And when do they follow up? Do they follow up right away, or do they follow up after the kind of the, the water has settled and they're feeling a little bit better? This is kind of a classic article uh, out of Japan by Itoi. Um, he did a randomized controlled trial. It was a multi-center uh, study looking at the position of, of immobilization following dislocation. The theory was, is that in a position, you can see in this image on the left, that in internal rotation, it actually did not approximate the anterior labral structures, okay? But actually what happened is when we put them in a position of external rotation, it put tension across the front part of the shoulder and actually approximated those things that were disrupted in the dislocation. Okay, so maybe more of an anatomical reduction of those things, not the joint, but actually the soft tissue structures. Uh, the mean age was 37, so these are mostly adults, okay. Um, they, they immobilized them for three weeks, okay. I've got a picture of the sling that they used, um, and then they didn't return them to play for three months, that they, they did not do PT. And this is not a perfect study, but it's, I think it's a classic article, and it's, it's one worth mentioning, because it's still maybe an appropriate treatment, okay, in certain cases. Because actually what Etoy demonstrated, and this is a, an example of that external rotation brace that he had these people in. They were supposed to wear it full time. Questionable compliance in both groups that did this, okay, which I think is an issue that we can all relate to, okay. I don't know about you, but my, none of my patients listen to everything they say, okay. But what he actually showed is that for those less than 20 years old, um, for those that were positioned in external rotation, only 40% experienced recurrence, okay? So 
maybe that's our high-risk population that we're talking about, and they didn't come out. For those that were older, actually only one in four, you know, 25% had a recurrence, okay? So um, unfortunately, since that time, nobody else has really been able to prove or reproduce the day, same data that he was able to demonstrate, okay? Um, that there's these two other uh, articles which show even maybe as high, um, there's an equivalent relocate, a recurrent dislocation rate by Finestone and then actually an increased rate of dislocations um, by this uh, 2010 article. So what's the right answer? Well, who knows? Um, either, bo both of them are probably reasonable to try. There's pros and cons to both. Um, external immobilization, yeah, I think we can all agree, based upon what we know about anatomy, that this probably better approximates um, the anterior structures that might be stretched out. This is not a super productive way. You know, we know from Rookie of the Year that this is not like something everybody really loves, okay? This position, though, is not, not necessarily um, the most practical, okay? Um, and so there's a question of compliance, and that's also super expensive. That brace that we use to put them in this position, we don't do it like uh, Dr. Itoy did. We, okay, we have a special uh, kind of padded brace, but it's expensive. Much more expensive than just a simple sling or even sometimes an, a sling and swath like an ace wrap. Um, so in, for internal rotation, it's great. It's, it's cheap. We think they're probably a little bit more compliant with it, um, but maybe it's not as anatomic as far as relocation to those injured structures. So a lot of controversy, okay? Do both of these patients, do they both get operative treatment? Do they both get non-operative treatment? I've got a, an algorithmic approach uh, to kind of start the discussion, okay, when you see these patients or are talking to them. So we know the immature shirtle, the, the range of recurrent instability, it may be 0%, it may be 100%, okay? We know that the younger they are, okay, especially between that 14 and 18 age range, okay, maybe even as much as 25, but th between that age range, it's a very, very high recurrence rate, okay? But when they get to be much younger, we know that they act different. So Cordishi in 2009 showed us that there were more of these atypical lesions that we talked about as opposed to the typical Bankhart and Hill Sachs lesions and had a 20% recurrence, so one in five, okay? And then Lambert in 2002 in this multi-center trial actually took all these patients that we think are, are less maybe or more likely to respond to non-operative treatment actually had a 0% recurrence rate. Small numbers, but nothing to, nothing to sneeze at. Um, so what do, we, what do we think that these age, you know, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine a couple of years back, uh, these, in this high-risk age group, that they were 24 times more likely to experience a recurrent dislocation event. So that's one of the first things that we'll want to know, okay? When the patient asks you, is this going to happen again? Do I need surgery? How does this need to be managed? Is how old are you? What are you going back to, okay? Um, so for these, there are four elements that may make us more likely to proceed or to consider surgical management. Um, we know that their age or their gender in a, plays a role in this, okay? Male patients that are going back to, uh, you know, the sport of football may be higher risk, and females, depending on where they are in their maturation, okay, and their collagen type, may or may not need uh, an operative or non-operative approach. We know that their age has a significant impact on that, that those between 14 and 25 are the highest risk population. We know that those are returning to active lifestyles and especially contact or collision sports like basketball and football are a much higher risk category. And we know those that have any degree of bone loss and what we're talking about with bone loss is those typical lesions, okay? The bone loss of the glenoid or bone loss of the humerus that with increasing amounts of bone loss, there's a correlative amount of recurrence rate, okay? So what are the consequences? This patient or this family member or this patient of yours that says, well, they told me I don't need surgery. What's, should I have surgery? What are the consequences of that? We know that their bone anatomy is at risk if we treat this without surgery, okay? Their bone anatomy is at risk if they have a recurrence, increasing amounts of glenoid bone loss, increasing rates of humeral head defects, okay? We know that that continues to compromise the soft tissues. We talked about the transition that happens in collagen type from three to one. It continues to put that at risk for plastic deformations. 
Uh, there's a, a really good randomized control trial in 2008 that showed that those that do recur have an increased rate of arthritis. This was a matched cohort between operative and non-operative patients. Um, so we do think that maybe those patients are more at likely at risk, the ones that recur and continue to come out, which I think we can all see how that would make sense. Um, and that they probably have worse outcomes, okay, that as far as recurrence rates. I mean, that's what we're overall looking at. But what are the consequences of surgery? Surgery is not always benign, okay? The risk of, of nerve or arterial-related injury, we think it's low, but it's not zero, okay? Um, that the recurrence rate is also not zero. I think we could all talk everybody into surgery if we said, hey, we're going to do this operation, and it's never going to happen again. But the reality is, is that even despite some of the best treatment and the appropriate uh, anticipatory guidance and counseling between the provider and the patient, that with surgery, it may still happen 15 to 17% of the time. But it may be course more cost effective, okay? Believe it or not, surgery is super expensive, right? But what else is expensive? ER visits, closure reductions, all of those things. So we have to consider the overall cost of the patient, the physical therapy visits, all of those things, they start to add up, okay, over time. So in summary, with the pediatric glenohumeral dislocation, so we have our first-time pediatric glenohumeral dislocation, 13-year-old, 15-year-old, 17-year-old. Um, we get the shoulder back in. We talked about a little bit about how to do that. Hopefully everybody's a little bit more comfortable with a couple of basic early techniques for doing that. Um, we should consider referral, okay, to a specialist for advanced imaging, x-ray, MRI, sometimes CT scan, okay, but really more of a discussion and a risk assessment, okay? What is the likelihood that this is going to happen again, okay? Um, and so that we can determine through a shared decision-making model who's appropriate for non-op treatment, maybe a brief period of immobilization, probably no more than three weeks in most of our hands. Um, PT for rotator cuff strengthening, scapular stabilization, okay, to reset the shoulder. Um, and then a reassessment between 6 and 12 weeks, okay? Or, based upon their risk factors, maybe they're not necessarily the greatest candidate for non-operative treatment, and maybe we're more aggressive in treating those with surgery. Um, for the 17-year-old, okay, senior year, he's probably much different. Even the same patient with the same problem, based upon the month that he dislocates, may be treated different ways. And those around sports can kind of understand this, that the one that happens in the off season, six months prior or just immediately after the conclusion of the season, we may be much more likely to treat that aggressively with surgical stabilization because we know his risk factors for relocation or redislocation are high. And we know that the likelihood we can get him back to a high level of play is a little bit better. I think that's all I got. Does anybody have questions? So uh, it's, a, it's a great question because that's really probably what we want to know, okay? We talk about the red flag. I think anybody that's got crepitus when you passively internally and externally rotate, especially that younger patient who's proximal humeral physis, so the, the athletic trainer is covering middle school, okay? This should be on your radar versus the athletic trainer is covering in the college setting. They don't have open growth plates there, okay? So... Crepitus with internal and external rotation, I would say that's a big one, okay, because we don't want to try and reduce a proximal humerus fracture without advanced imaging. So that'd be one. A clavicle fracture, okay, you know, one that somebody that has a clavicle fracture in addition to concern for a shoulder dislocation, I would say that's a, a, um, a contraindication. And loosely what I would say is that actually the recommendations for neuro, distal neuropraxia is that a, a one-time attempt at a reduction, even with paresthesias, may be warranted to see if it, if it, if it resolves. Okay, so it's, I would say, relative contraindication, not direct contraindication. Gotcha. Okay, another question. Um, can you give us a quick description of volitional instability and maybe some tips on how to identify it? Of what? Volitional instability. Oh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I think that uh, many times comes down to history, 
I, I think uh, for those that uh, don't know, uh, you know, kind of the term volitional instability, we, we do have a subset of patients that, that actually maybe have the ability to dislocate their shoulder. Maybe they had it acutely, they develop traumatic instability, but then are able to kind of continue to, to dislocate their shoulder. Uh, or maybe they're so unstable or so stretchy that they can actually do it. Uh, I, so I think that it, many times the volitional dislocator, the thing that makes us tipped off that they may be doing it volitionally is teasing that out in the story, okay? That the traumatic dislocation is pretty obvious. Those people are generally very painful, especially the first time it happens. The volitional dislocator, they're usually pretty calm. They usually will tell you my shoulder's out, and if you sit little long enough, they'll eventually tell you they put it out. So, I think in the story, in the history. Yeah. Try four. It's, it's a great question, actually. I, have, um, I, I think I've, I don't have gray hair yet, but I think I do have enough experience to know that, I, I mean, I've seen a change in, in my practice, even from, uh, from just starting, that not everybody did get advanced imaging. They may not have gotten an MRI uh, right away. Uh, in, in my hands and in my opinion, uh, right or wrong, I, I think most everybody's getting advanced imaging early. Uh, I, think it's, I think it helps us to make informed decisions. I think it's very difficult to make an accurate risk assessment to assess recurrence rates without, we can get x-rays, and x-rays can tell us some of the story, but they may not tell us all of the story and a young patient with one of those atypical lesions that may only be evident on MRI will drastically change their outlook and our treatment algorithm um, over the, you know, the next four to six months. So uh, I think even in a rural community, if, it, if you're not sure, I think a referral, okay, to help make that decision, okay, is even better than, than maybe not assessing their entire risk. Is there an optimal timing with that? Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. Uh, I think acutely in those first, actually, in that first two days, um, we talk about this maybe a little bit outside the scope of this, but we talk about does the shoulder need contrast to be able to see a labral tear? In these very, very acute ones, there may be evidence that with some blood in the joint from an acute event, you might be able to see that stuff without contrast there. But... Um, if it's been outside of that time window, which many times they are given the referral process and how long it's been, um, I, I think, no, there's not necessarily a, a time. I think you can see these changes at two to three days, and you'll still see them at six weeks. So, Yeah, so that's a great question. So Little League shoulder uh, involves the thing that we were kind of talking about when we were talking about the growth plate at the top of the humerus. Um, so unlike a traumatic event where the shoulder may dislocate or become unstable, we think that little league shoulder is more related to the pull and a chronic inflammation of that growth plate. And so uh, they don't get the typical lesions that we talked about. So they don't typically have hill sacs lesions. They don't, t they don't develop labral tears or things like that. But they, we can see sometimes later we can see changes actually on their x-ray that will demonstrate widening or inflammation at that growth plate. So that's really more of that's kind of more in the history. The person that has, because Little League shoulder, they, they have a story to tell. Their, their shoulder didn't just start hurting. They may have had an acute event, but if you really tease it out, they've had issues for, for a few days or a few weeks, or sometimes even a few months. So. It's actually not a fracture. It's actually, it's an indentation. So it's a softer part of the bone. And so when, the, when it comes out and hits this edge of the socket, it actually, it, it, it's on the back of the humeral head. Yeah. I've got a few questions for you, Ben. I'd also right. like to echo Go easy on me. Uh, Jared's um, comments. I, I thought that was a phenomenal talk and uh, really enjoyed listening to it. And, and you know, um, I feel like, I, you know, you learn a lot and you hear a lot of things, that, you know, from... Uh, your own experiences, and, and I would tell you that, uh, no, number one, I, I would just re-emphasize, um, I realize that we live in a world in which um, we need to be sure we have a comfort level to do something, um, and that you are uh, allowed, in quotes, uh, to do things, and I would tell you, uh, 
from my own experience, I really appreciate some of your emphasis on um, if you have the ability, the training, and the comfort level, and uh, you know a collaborative effort with your team physician uh, or any physician. I think uh, an attempt at an early reduction would be, um, you know, is, is not an unrealistic expectation. I can tell you from my own experiences, you uh, doubt it. The first time my shoulder came out, it was out for seven hours, and it, I, I remember every minute of those seven hours, and it's because I was with a PT and athletic trainer who did not feel comfortable to reduce it, um, and so that was a, um, you know, certainly I wish, uh, or you know, everything's fine now, but uh, I think it is a really great point. Um, I'm going to touch on a few more things. You, you talked about surround the, yourself with some better athletic trainers and physical therapists. <laughs> Uh, I have now. You have now. That was in the past. Thank goodness. Uh, much I've, I've upgraded. Um, uh, the uh, a couple of concepts. We we talked a little bit about the early immobilization and the controversy between internal external rotation and the length of time. Um, I just you know just to review, what is your protocol for you when you have a first time shoulder dislocator? What are you doing? What are you recommending when they come to clinic? What's your like two sentences of what you do with them? Uh, I do not. I have not adopted the external rotation and mobilization. I don't think it's well tolerated. People, people don't like it. They hit doorways and they walk through them. I think a position of comfort, I think internal rotation is a very reasonable thing, and I think it does allow for them to be comfortable faster. Um, so my, my traditional kind of approach is a brief period of mobilization. If we, after risk assessment, and we say... What's brief? So I'll get there. So after risk assessment, and we say that we're going to try a non-operative approach based on advanced imaging or whatever... Brief period of mobilization, two weeks, no more than three. I usually start them with pendulums, range of motion recovery, reassess and allowed range of motion between that three and six week mark. And then at six weeks, we're usually assessing them because I'm hoping they have full range of motion around that time, transitioning to strength and a consideration of return to play depending on what their sport is um, between eight and 12 weeks. So another great concept uh, that, you know, maybe as an athletic trainer or a primary care uh, physician, you know, you, you send a senior football player um, in maybe September who has a shoulder dislocation in season, <laughs> um, and they say, you know, my, my shoulder feels fine. Can I finish the season? What do you think? Is it doable, possible? Do you put the shoulder at more risk? Yeah, I think uh, this is the risk assessment and discussion, and we I briefly mentioned that the same patient with the same problem, depending on the timing, may have different outcomes, and they may have a different decision. That the kid that comes in here right now, so you know, two a days just started. We got scrimmages this week and first games next week. The shoulder dislocation that happens now, uh, if I tell them that we can get you back, just give me eight weeks, they're gonna laugh. They're going to write a bad review for Dr. Ellis, and they're going to go get another opinion. Um, that, yes, assessment, and when they have full, I and mean, I think this is, you know, uh, 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 Dr. Tokish um, has, a, has a publication on this about that, you know, an appropriate discussion about risk assessment when they have full pain-free range of motion, that anticipatory guidance for the family, that their risk of real dislocation is high, and that would be dependent upon probably position even, discussion about that. What position do they play? Another discussion about bracing. Do they or do they not brace? Um, so you could potentially put your shoulder at risk. You only get one senior year. I think it's, a, I think it's an out, a, a risk versus benefits discussion with the family because you may have two patients, both 17-year-old, both senior, both in the same season and one family may decide one thing, and one may decide the other. And I don't know that there's necessarily a right or a wrong answer, um, because it's really based upon what they value and what their, fo what their primary focus is. Because in this day and age, NIL, money on the line, scholarships, all of these things, senior year is kind of important, and they may decide that it's a risk of a redislocation, but allowed continued participation for that scholarship or that money or that that potential to play at the next level is worth that risk. Yeah, so um, so the, the, to go back to your reduction maneuvers um, and the, the, uh, the maneuver, the sense of maneuver where you have the patient prone, the shoulder is kind of hanging off the bed, uh, 
you tie weights to their arm, um, you know, whether you put some manual uh, pressure on their scapula or not, how long do you think you can leave them there safely? Or what's like, what's, you know, what's some guidance in terms of, you know, you know, can, can you just leave them there for hours and hours, yeah, or is it a ten-minute technique, no, or what, what? What do you think is the best? Uh, you know, how long can you leave them there safely? I think after I think after ten minutes, I'm probably um, depending on the scenario with somebody coming that may be more qualified or maybe more comfortable to reduce it. Um, I think ten minutes, if they haven't done anything or it hasn't changed, um, I think that's probably. A reasonable amount of time. I, I I don't think leaving them there for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, or certainly an hour would be. I, I don't necessarily know that it'd be dangerous. I just don't think it's. I think you pass kind of the point of when you would expect to get benefit from that particular maneuver. Maybe I'm wrong though. Well, if we don't have uh, any more questions in the audience or any online questions, um, I think on behalf of Jared and myself. Um, oh, we do. We're right down. Never mind. In a situation where maybe there's there's no one, there's no PT, there's no athletic yep. trainer, there's no mm -hmm. no physician, uh, is it better for that person to just leave it at it as is, or is there a technique that someone no. can self-reduce? Out of curiosity, I, I think those two maneuvers, when you talk about a Stimson or a uh, you know kind of gentle pressure on their scapula, I think those can be performed by anyone. That's a great question. Uh, you know, the coach that doesn't have anybody with them. Um, or the physician that's got a shoulder dislocation and can't relocate it themselves, I think it's a really reasonable thing to do. Um, whether they're going to wait it out and say, well, we're going to try this and figure it out, uh, you know, I think it may be one of those things that you say, hey, we're going to get, we're going to get mom or dad on the phone, we're going to wait, and in that time period where we're doing this, you know, putting them on their belly and putting a little bit of gentle weight on their hand or their wrist, I think it's a really reasonable thing to do. I do think it's safe, and I, I think the worst thing that could happen is they continue to have a dislocated shoulder by the time mom and dad get there and they're going to a higher level of care. And the best thing that could happen is the shoulder may reduce and it helped. It's a great question. Any more? All right. Thanks, Ben. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Great talk.